Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction Company, taking a look at some of the guns that they are going to be selling in their upcoming September of 2017 premiere auction. And today we're taking a look at another US military trials magazine rifle. This is an 1882 pattern Chaffee Reese rifle. And it's a great example of a good idea poorly executed, or rather, what seems like a good idea on paper that's not really a very good idea in the field. So this was originally patented in 1879 by two guys, Reuben Chaffee and General James Reese. They came up with the design together. I'm not entirely sure whose role was what. But the, the basic reason for the existence of this rifle is to have a tube magazine in which the cartridges are not actually touching nose to case. So the potential problem of a tube magazine is that if you have a, lar a sharp impact on the tube, because the bullet from one cartridge is touching the primer of the next cartridge, you do actually have the potential to detonate cartridges in the tube magazine. It doesn't happen very often, but it can happen. There are a number of military trials where designs were dropped from consideration because it actually happened during testing. So the idea that Chaffee and Reese had was, what if we have a tube magazine so we can get a bunch of rimmed cartridges in the gun without needing a box magazine of some sort and without having a single shot rifle, but let's design a magazine that actually holds the cartridges slightly apart so that there's no risk of detonation. They presented this idea to the US military um, at the uh, US uh, magazine rifle trials in 1882, and got a pretty warm reception. The army thought, wow, that actually, that's a great idea. We were kind of concerned about that problem. Why don't you make us a big batch of these rifles and we'll put them through field trials? Well, apparently the early testing they had done was like all very clean static on a clean, you know, a square shooting range, that sort of thing. Um, because these rifles were not destined to do well in field trials. Now, in order to do this, Chaffee and Reese had to find someone to actually make a large batch of these rifles, because they didn't have the facilities to do it themselves. They apparently approached Colt, and Colt said, sure, you guys want 750, but we're only going to make 200, and we're going to charge you $150 a piece. Which is, well, to put it in context, a typical repeating 4570 bolt action rifle like this, something like a Remington Keen, would normally commercially sell for something in the $20 to $30 range. So $150 bucks a piece for the guns, and then only to get about a third or a quarter as many as they wanted, uh, that was not a good deal. Uh, so they went looking elsewhere. They couldn't find any other company that they could convince to manufacture these guns. Uh, Colt, by the way, made the right call on that one. Uh, so because Reese was a major in the army, uh, he had some connections, and he was able to convince Springfield Armory to manufacture the field trials rifles for them. So uh, Springfield manufactured 753 of these rifles in 1883 and 1884, and they were then sent off for field trials, where they did really badly. Um, they had the magazine system, the idea sounds good, the implementation is not so good. The way they did this was basically having two sets of cammed tracks in the magazine. So one set held the cartridges in place, and then another one would come, would, would grab the cartridges and pull them forward, and then drop down and reciprocate. It's a system kind of like what you have in the hopper of a Type 11 light machine gun, Japanese light machine gun, sort of. Um, you basically, there's no spring in the magazine tube, it's loaded through the butt, and there's, you just have space for five cartridges going up the tube, and they don't actually contact each other. The problem is, you have a piece of, of steel, a rod, that's like this long, that has to cycle back and forth inside the action. Actually, it starts like back here. Um, and that thing, if it gets dirty at all, it jams up, and it takes then a lot of force to operate the bolt, because the bolt is directly connected to that camming cycling system. Uh, it's very difficult to clean this system. It's actually even really difficult just to get the bolt out of the rifle. In fact, I have I found some instructions, but they're kind of frightening instructions, and I don't want to mess with potentially damaging a rifle that's in really nice condition like this one. So I'm not taking the bolt out of this thing. Um, it also had problems with a particularly heavy bolt throw, a heavy trigger, broken parts. You put this thing in the hands of grunts, and it just didn't survive. So 
uh, it placed near the bottom of the rifles that actually went into field trials. In fact, it may have actually been the least successful one of the entire batch, if I remember correctly. And nothing further ever came of them. Uh, after that, the US military surplused these to Bannermen. Well, they sold them on the surplus market, and the Francis Bannerman Company bought them all. Uh, and then took a very long time to manage to sell them. Apparently Bannerman still had them offered in the catalog as late as 1907. So the Army didn't want them, and nobody else really did either. Uh, this is an example of one of the bolt-action trials magazine rifles that did not ever get sold on the commercial market, or manufactured for commercial sale. Most of the other ones did. Usually, you know, the Winchester Hotchkiss, the Remington Keene, all of these other guns were being manufactured by commercial companies, and when they failed to get a military contract, they'd make up their, their R&D expenses by selling them commercially. Well, these were manufactured by the Springfield Arsenal, by the US government. Uh, by the way, at a cost of about $56 a piece. So they, they did get a much better deal from Springfield than they would have from Colt. Uh, but after the trials were over, Springfield wasn't in a position to sell stuff commercially, so the rifle just went pow. There are a couple markings on these rifles that are of note. The most important one is here on the side of the receiver, US Springfield, 1884. Up on the barrel, we have a V over a P over an eagle which is a, uh, a final approval proof on the guns. There is this Circle P stock cartouche behind the, uh, the rear tang of the trigger guard. And we have the inspector's approval stamp, 1884 dated, on the back corner of the buttstock. So that's it for the markings, that's everything that's on there. These rifles were not serialized, by the way, so no numbers on them. Other than the trigger and the bolt handle, there is only one other control on here. There's no manual safety for example. Uh, however, we do have a magazine cutoff. So the forward position is cut off uh, and single loading, and the rearward position is for using the magazine. This was another complaint during the trials, that this was easily bumped um, out of whatever position it happened to be in. When it comes to functioning, this is a cock on close action, and you can see that there's a little connector here, uh, basically connected to the extractor. That drops down into a channel in the receiver, and this is what actuates the magazine. So this thing is moving that, that mobile rack in the magazine tube back and forth. When closing the bolt, it gets to this point, and then you have to apply a fair amount of spring tension and cam it down to, uh, to lock the bolt closed. That cocks the action. We do have a striker back here, so you can manually decock or recock the action. And this is locked just by the bolt handle. That was fairly typical of black powder 4570 rifles. And by the way, this is only made in 4570, because they were only made for military contract. I'm going to see if I can get you any sort of good view of the magazine tube. You have to load it from the back, and you have to have the bolt open in order to open the trap door. And by the way, another complaint during trials was that uh, loading this, guys tended to stick the muzzle into the dirt in order to have access to the magazine tube, and that could easily plug the muzzle and cause major problems. Anyway, with the bolt open, don't cringe, I'm just going to very gently use this as a lever to get in there, so we can open the lever. Uh, if you try to open this with the bolt closed, I suspect you will bend something, because it really doesn't want to open. And you can't really see much in there, but you can see that there are two bars, one of them here, and one of them located up there on the right. And those are going to cycle back and forth independently, and uh, hold cartridges in place, and then pull them up into the chamber. Looking at this from the front end, you can see some of the other elements of it, but there's just no good view in there. This is a little finger that's going to go down for feeding. And we have more of our track here. It's pretty easy to imagine how dirt gets into this track, uh, while the rifle's in use. Now, when the bolt's closed, it mostly covers that, but there's still space for, for dust to get in there. If you take this thing out on a, a hard march, hard cavalry uh, march through the course of a day, this thing's going to get full of dust, and there's just no way to clean that out. And that's going to become just a nightmare of an inoperable rifle. The bright side of this trials debacle is that the guns that were left at the end were either completely beaten up from being in the trials, or they were guns that probably didn't ever get issued, and are in remarkably nice condition. And this is one of those rifles. It's got really nice cartouches on it, the 
finish, except for the buttstock, um, is in really good shape. It's, it's a very nice example of a very unsuccessful rifle. So definitely a cool piece for uh, those people who are interested in the military history of the adoption of new technology. If you'd like to have this particular one, uh, take a look at the description text below. You'll find a link there to Rock Island's catalog page on the gun. Uh, that has their pictures, their description, uh, their price estimates, and all the other information you might need to know if you decide that you want to place a bid on it, which can be done either over the phone, through the website, or live here at the auction. Thanks for watching.